Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete podcast, hosted by yours truly, Rob Martin. Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete, a podcast dedicated to diving deep into what makes athletes who they are. Today's guest raced bikes at a very high level and is a key figure in getting our youngsters on bikes. Her accomplishments are as follows. In 2011, at the 24-hour single speed national championships, she was numero uno. Also in 2011, at the Victoria 100, she was first. And that same year at Iceman, she was number one on the single speed. In 2012, she was the first single speed at Lumberjack, and in the 2014 LJ100, she was the first female overall. In 2015, she was fourth in the World Solo 24-hour championships and first at Margie. As I mentioned, she works with the youth through the Dirt Dogs program. Our guest today is Danielle Musto, who resides in Michigan, Welcome, Danielle. A pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me. All right. I'm going to slap you with the first question here. Do you have anything that you're tired of talking about? Bikes. I think that's the end of our podcast. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, not at all. Okay. If you had the choice between these bikes to ride down the beach, which one would you choose? (laughs) These are all custom Rob builds. Okay. <laughs> a single speed carbon 20 pound fat bike with only two inch wide wheels, a 12 speed steel 45 pound fat bike with 3.5 inch wheels, tires, or a custom <laughs> aluminum 30 pound fat bike with six inch wide tires and only three gears. All right, that's tough. Steel is real, but I think I'll go with the aluminum bike with the fat tires. That's a good choice. That would have been my pick. Uh Any particular reason why you went with that? Oh, just because I've ridden on the beach a lot, and the wider the tire, the more you float. The faster you can go. Absolutely. I I get the dunes with, what were they, six inch? (laughs) Six inch? Yes. Yeah, I might make it up the dunes with that. (laughs) I think you could. (laughs) Can you take us through the 24-hour single speed race in 2011, where it was, maybe the weather, and walk us through the race itself? Yeah, it was um, so long ago. I'll try to remember. It was in Palmer (laughs) Park, Colorado, and I was racing on, I had two single speeds set up. One was an aluminum salsa Selma, and then the other one was a Thai salsa Selma. So they were basically identical identical minus you know one was aluminum one was Thai and I want to say the course was like eight miles long strangely enough I don't remember what month it was (laughs) I think it was like September (laughs) (laughs) but I remember really nice weather you know I had my pit crew out there the course was probably one of the most technical courses that I had ever ridden up until that point Margie came after that. So I can say it was the most technical course up until that point. It had a lot of short power climbs. It was um, incredibly rocky. And, you know, I had done a lot of 24 racing up until up until that point. And everyone, like the consensus, consensus was, this is a hard course for 24-hour racing. I think racing on a single speed actually helped because I, I had no choice but to make the climbs, you know. So it was tough because it was... The, the climbs were tough, and you only have one gear. Only one gear. I think I ran at 18, 21, and I remember being out there with my mechanic and just being like, I need an easier gear. And he was like, well, tough. I drove out to Colorado. <laughs> we have two bikes set up with this gear ratio, and this is what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tough. <laughs> uh-huh. Can you maybe – Walk us through a little bit of the race, maybe like from the start, and tell us a little bit about how that went off and and maybe about the finish. And was there anyone near you at the finish? How'd that go? With 24-hour racing, there's you have to get into the mindset that you are going to be out on the course for 24 hours straight. And I trained, you know, really long days for it, but 
it's always kind of like there's a somber moment at the start because you're saying goodbye to your pit crew and you know that you'll come through and that you'll see them. But it's also you know that you're going to have some really like hard moments during those 24-hour races. So people are cheering and people are happy, but it's also just like, oh, my goodness, it's go time. This is going to hurt. So we always used to start with a Le Mans start where we'd have to run a little bit just to kind of spread out the field. And mentally, I would always break the race down into like eight-hour segments because that was easier for me. You know, you always feel really great at the start. Six hours in was always where like it was like the first reality bites moment for me because I was like, oh, things are starting to hurt. But I have a really, really long time to go still. <laughs> I have another 18 hours, right? <laughs> yeah. And then um, nighttime would eventually fall. And then it was almost a whole nother race. I would ride with night Rider lights on my helmet and on my handlebar. And every time I'd come in through my pit area, you know, every other lap, I'd switch my bike. We'd have to switch a helmet or switch batteries really quickly. It was kind of like NASCAR on bikes. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess to keep going, I guess I have to talk a really long time about 24-hour racing because it is a really long time, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. There's always a point in, I would say, the middle of the night, for me at least, around 3 a.m. where, I don't know, I'd get just like I'd want to be off of my bike. And my brain would start playing, tr playing tricks on me. Um, I would think that I was seeing things in the woods because you're so fatigued at that point. And I do remember at this race, they had a mannequin sitting in the wood, <laughs> like in the middle of nowhere. And I always thought, like every single time, I thought it was a human being. But then eventually the birds start to chirp. That was always the first sign that like hope was, hope was in the, you know, hope was, there was hope that it was eventually going to be daylight again. And then you could slowly see like a pink in the sky. And then eventually the sun would rise and you would see friendly faces again as you would come through the pit area. And it was, it was always such a good feeling. Do you remember what the elevation was there? I do. I want to say that it was around 6,000 to 6,500 at the base. And I think it topped off about like 8,000. So it wasn't that high. Okay. Which was good for me because I've raced like the Breck 100 and I, I mean that, I think Wheeler Pass was like 12.5 and I don't like higher elevations personally. I never <laughs> do well, but yeah. that was like, it was decent. I was out of breath, but not too bad. And then when you finished, was there anyone close to you? No. Um, I want to say I probably, I think I, in the single speed category, I was like, I had by two laps at that point. So I definitely had a good gap. And I want to say it was like fourth overall in the open women's class too. Yeah. Two laps is a big gap. Yeah. <laughs> you got a lot of room for a mechanical in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember how many hours you were putting in on the bike to prepare for that race? I think for the most part, I would probably ride anywhere between like 20-ish hours a week, maybe a little bit more than that. But I do remember that I would do really intense intervals during the week, a lot of threshold at times or steady state intervals. But as I got closer to the race, I would start to build up longer days. And you can't really go out and do a 24 hour race because that would just destroy you. So like, <laughs> I think that the most that my coach had me do for like nationals would be, I do like one eight hour day mountain biking and then follow that by another like seven hour day. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You can't go out and do a 24 hour before a 24 hour or you'll just destroy no. yourself. Yeah. Do you remember how long it took you to recover from that race? Oh, a long time. So my coach did tell me out of all the athletes that she's ever had, I was the one who took the longest to recover. So oh. <laughs> I, I don't, like for me, I would usually take two weeks off a bike. Okay. Um, when I first started riding, that was really hard for me because I would try to like you know, immediately hop back on my bike and I would always feel bad. And it's kind of hard mentally when you peak for a race and you feel so good. And then you just feel like the slowest, worst bike racer ever. But <laughs> so I just knew recovery takes time, but that's important. Can you tell us a little bit about the Victoria 100, where that's held, what kind of race that was and walk us through that one? It was somewhere in Canada. <laughs> also a really long time. I, it was I don't know where it was. I know that, yeah, I can't even tell you where it was. I used to sleep on my road trip. <laughs> um, that was, uh, it, 
it happened over their holiday. Like they have this Victoria holiday. And I remember it was a very, very, very technical race for a hundred miler. I think it took me almost like 12 hours. It wasn't technical, like Rocky and Rudy, like um, nationals was, it was just very twisty and turny. I, I can't even describe another course like it. So nonstop on the brakes, slow yeah. corners type. Mm -hmm. Okay. Never really get much of a flow going on. I'm not sure if they're still doing that race. I tried to look it up and I don't, I'm not sure that they are, to be honest okay. with you. Now we can shift gears a little bit. And I okay. want you to tell us or tell me how the Dirt Dogs came about and why you are so passionate about that program. The Dirt Dogs started kind of towards the end of my racing career, but Back when I was in school, I was always kind of, I don't know, I never really like found my place. Like I was in different sports and, you know, I was in marching band and everything, but I never found like much confidence from what I was doing. And I remember once I started riding a bike, I was like, this is me. Like I felt like I was finally in my own skin and all of a sudden, like what other people thought of me didn't matter. And I was always thinking like, this would have been so great if I would have felt this way back when I was like in middle school and high school, when I was trying to like deal with like, you know, high school bullies and everything or boys who were picking on me. Like if I could have been really fast on a bike, I'd have been like, I will just ride over you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. So I started doing some group rides and there were kids who would just come and ride along, you know, with their parents. And I would listen to the kids talk and they would just ride their mountain bikes and talk about things that they were dealing with. And I realized that when you're being active and you're out in the woods and you're surrounded by nature, you kind of like lose any sort of anxiety that you might have. And you, it's easier to open up to people. And that's basically what gave me the idea for the Dirt Dogs. I was like, it would be so cool to start like a little kids mountain bike team that's open to everyone. And it's just, I mean, you still have that, you're still like on a team, but we focus on like individual strengths and everyone's self-esteem just builds organically as they ride together. And so what age groups are those? Well, it's our youngest is, is one and a half and it tops off at 15. So it's a vast age group for sure. That's awesome. What nights do you guys practice? We practice on Mondays and Wednesdays. This year we had about 433-ish kids. I think a few, a few more jumped in. So we split them up. We split the groups in half. That's, that's, an, it's, that's, it's, an, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> that's really cool. I mean, mm -hmm. getting kids on bikes I don't know. I'm I'm a believer in if you're on a bike, you're a happier person. You're a better person to be around. So getting kids on bikes, I think, is amazing. And I think what you're doing there is amazing. It's really cool. And I will say, like, we have so many great people. Like, I, I feel really fortunate to live, like, in the West Michigan community because there's so many great cyclists. And it's obviously, I am not coaching 433 kids. We have 56 coaches, and they are, like, the heart – in soul of the program. Like, I mean, they're donating their time and every week they show up and they are, they, our coaches are amazing. Like the kids look up to them. And I think the coaches actually have a lot of fun with them too. It's kind of like what we have, I think with the coyotes, although we're probably a little different because we're more race oriented, mm -hmm. but we're still getting the kids on bikes and it's still good to be out there with the kids and coaching them along. And it's nice to see more kids on bikes. Oh, for sure. <laughs> All right, let's go back in time and talk about okay. when and how you got started on the bike. I was 23, and, it's, and I actually started riding a bike because I met a boy, and I thought he was super cute, and he was a bike racer. <laughs> <laughs> he w took me out on this date, and all he would talk about was mountain biking. And so I was like, I also have a mountain bike. And I did. Like, my parents had bought me, like, this $200 diamond bag. <laughs> and I was like, in my mind, I was like, this is a really nice, <laughs> this is a really nice mountain bike. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to, like, show off. So I was like, I'm going to go mountain biking with you. And it was a disaster. I fell so many times. Oh. So many times. Like, I wasn't even riding my bike. <laughs> <laughs> but... I remember going to a few races and handing off water bottles and I was like, no, this isn't for me. I want to race. And I, I like somehow managed to stay on my bike long enough to learn how to ride it. So that's how it all started. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> the diamond back with a cute boy. 
Yep. Yeah. The boy's gone. Actually, the bike's gone now too, but I kept the bikes. <laughs> I kept going on with the bikes. Heck yeah. yeah. Good. How about let's think about a race in your past that was challenging, but fun at the same time. And can you describe that race or take us through that experience? Okay. I do have a race. It was Polar Roll. Um, and I can't even remember the year. It was the year that the snow was super, super mushy, and all of my 45 North teammates would know the year because no one could stay on their bike. And I remember, like, stay on their bikes. I remember riding along with one of my best friends, April Morgan, and it was we were just laughing because we were constantly just falling over for no reason. Like, we were riding on, like, double track and falling. But it was it was such a fun day because everyone was in the same boat. Like, when you made it to that finish line, you earned you earned you earned the medal. <laughs> I think I remember hearing about that one in particular. Mm-hmm. Was it around 2016, 17 maybe? Or earlier? It might have been earlier than that. It might have been like 2014 or 15. I think there's been a few of them. Okay. Okay. It was just they had so much snow, but then they had a warm up. So like you I think we could only run like three and a half to four PSI. And I like your front wheel would just plant in like giant snow banks. And then, yeah. Yeah. And then you're crashing or falling or walking. Mm-hmm. So it was basically mashed potatoes. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, yeah. And for those that don't, haven't ridden a fat bike in the snow, I'm going to recommend that you go out when you get a little bit of that and try to ride the trail and you'll experience exactly what she's talking about. Mm-hmm. It's almost impossible to ride the trail. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's more impossible when you've got people in front that have gotten off their bike and broken through the mashed potatoes to make it even worse. Yeah, it is. It is so true. Honestly, I feel like I know not everyone loves running, but if you're a fat bike racer, I would recommend learning to run a little bit. That's <laughs> what helps me. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. You're yeah. not going to stay on the bike. What other sports and activities have you done in the past that you believe have translated to a better you on the bike? I guess I took karate. I I think karate taught me like mental toughness. (laughs) But other than that, biking was really like my first sport that I loved. I just kind of came out of nowhere. Like up until that point, I was, you know, going to college and working a lot. And then I started riding and it was a whole new world for me. I Mm -hmm. think you're right. Karate teaches discipline, and in order to be good on the bike, you have to have discipline, and you also have to go into this deep, sometimes dark pain cave to push yourself beyond your normal limits. So, Oh, yeah, I definitely. Think, yeah, karate probably did help out with that part of, you know, mm-hmm. part of the sport. Yeah, What was the best investment that you made in yourself or maybe a parent, family member, or friend made in you that was the most helpful along the way that made you so good on the bike? Oh, I would for sure say a power tap. Learning to train by power helped a ton. Okay. Yeah, I started working with Linda Wallenfels. Um, She was a coach out in Utah, and she told me, she was like, the only way that I'll coach you is if you buy a power tap. And especially for me, because my heart rate, my heart can be so responsive to like any sort of situation. It's not necessarily accurate. Like I could be at a start line and my heart rate would be 130 just standing there because I'd be so nervous. Um, But power is just constant, right? So like she would do really like training blocks where I just do steady state intervals day after day. And my heart rate would always be different, but the power would be constant. And that's where I noticed huge improvements. Okay, that makes sense. I know. Mm -hmm. Even normal heart rates, I mean, your heart rate lags behind when you start to get into an interval. So if you're going into an interval and it's lagging behind, you could then be in a different zone that you're not supposed to be in to get the heart rate, right? Yeah. To get the heart rate to where it's supposed to be. And then you're like, oh, now it's going too high. And then you slow down and now you're probably going out of the zone you're supposed to be in into a lower zone. So power, power is super important and... I think if you can use power in your training, you're going to see huge benefits rather than just using a heart rate monitor. Yeah, definitely worth the investment. I will say that much. <laughs> did you did you have power on, did you do any indoor training or was it all outdoor training? And did you have a power meter on all your bikes or just one of your bikes? Just on my mountain bike. So okay. in the winter, I would ride on the trainer and I would just um, swap out the tire. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So I would always, I think like for most of my intervals in the winter, I would always do it on the trainer from what I remember. And then if I would just do like long endurance rides, I would take my fat bike out in the winter. And then I wouldn't train with power on those days just because they were like endurance rides. Right. But all intervals were on the trainer inside because it's really hard to do intervals in the winter here in Michigan. I've noticed, you know, I mean, like, you know, our roads, it's not the safest. No. <laughs> <laughs> Cars on icy roads and trying to ride a bike is not a good combination. Correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone influence you to get into the sport other, other than the boy? Other than the boy? No, not at all. <laughs> I will say I started to meet a lot of um, other female mountain bikers in Michigan after I started racing. And then I became a lot more, I guess, more brave because for a while I was always riding alone or I was always trying to keep up with a group of guys and they were super nice, but it's, it's hard to like want to try new things or like maybe practice like skills when you're also like kind of like worried about not being able to keep up. So that helped a lot. Nice. Most of my best friends I've met through bike racing or riding. There's a lot of cool people you can meet just getting on a bike. It is very true, yeah. <laughs> As you furthered into your biking career, did you ever look up to any of the professional mountain bikers or cyclists? One of my best friends, April Morgan, um, she was on the 45 North team. I really looked up to her a lot because she she just um, had the per- had this has this personality that's so like open and friendly. But she also taught me to chill a bit (laughs) because I would be so serious going into a race and so hard on myself. So one of the biggest like pieces of advice she gave me when I was going to Worlds was like, just stay in the present and have fun. And honestly, that made a huge difference during the race because I would be so hard on myself even during a race. If I didn't think I was going fast enough, I would beat myself up or if I messed up on something I would be mad about that and thinking about that as I was moving forward. So I think like learning to stay present really helped me. That's good advice because I know yeah. even myself getting on a start line, very serious. I mean, when I started, usually always until recently, I've learned to tone it down a bit. And then the same thing, a mistake or not where I was wanting to be during a race or even as a result of a race, very hard on myself and now I'm just trying to learn that it's just just have fun and be present. Oh, yeah. And then two other people, um, Sue Haywood, she used to race for track. Okay. I think she's been retired for a while, but I remember when I first started racing, like she said my, she was like, hi, Danielle, once at the start of a race. And it like made my life like super like down to earth. And I don't know, I, I think sometimes racers probably don't realize like just by like recognizing someone or taking time to say hi, how much of an impact it can have on like people who are just getting into the sport. Absolutely. When and what was your first ever race on the bike? And take us through that. Okay, so my first ever race was Ithaca. I don't know when. It was in the summer. And I don't even know what year. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I don't pay attention to the little details, but I raced on a Voodoo Bazango, and I know I had a Woody derailleur. I don't know if you ever saw those. Uh uh-uh. uh. Like, they were like, okay. And I don't, it was just like a derailleur that was looked like it was made out of wood. I bought this like awesome bike from a mechanic. It was super cool. So I showed up to the race, and I was racing beginner, and all these like guys were like, your derailleur is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember being very proud. <laughs> so <clears throat> I just remember with the race, like I took off and I remember like everyone was like, don't go off too hard. And of course I went off too hard and I crashed in the first corner. And it was like the hardest race I'd ever done because I'd only been racing for probably two months at that point. And I think we had to do two laps on the course. And after my first lap, some guy had told me, he's like, you're racing on a flat tire. And I was so happy because I was like, good, I can stop. And then he ran out and like pumped it back up. So I had to keep going, but (laughs) (laughs) it was fun afterwards. Like I was so bruised, you know, scratched up. I fell in like, I think I fell in like a pricker bush, but I was completely hooked. Nice. (laughs) Yeah. It was the, the feeling of crossing a finish line. I mean, regardless of how you do, it's a great feeling. What was the name of that bike again? It's okay. So a voodoo bazango. The, it was, the brand was Voodoo. It was this really, really sweet company. I don't know if they're still around. They're from the West Coast. And what size wheels? 
26 inch for 26? sure. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> I'm starting to feel archaic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to look that bike up when we get off the podcast. Mm-hmm. Look up the derailleur, derailleur too. I think it was like a Woody. Like I, I'm not making this up. It looked like it was made out of wood, but it was super cool. And they called it a Woody derailleur? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. I think it was SRAM. It was grip shift. I will check that too. I'm, I'm interested <laughs> to see these things. Yeah. How many hours a week do you spend on the bike these days? Sadly, not so much right now. Um, I work at Cannonsburg, so I have this giant playground outside. But I've been training for a marathon, so I'm mostly running because I've never run a marathon, and that's coming up Labor Day weekend. Then I'm back out on my bike. Oh, nice. So you do have something coming up that you're training for. Yes. (laughs) I guess I forgot about that. (laughs) (laughs) And what is that? What's that marathon? It's Marquette Marathon. Oh, the Marquette. Yeah. Okay. And that you said it's when again? Labor Day weekend. So it's September 3rd. It is like, I guess, yeah. next weekend. Yeah. You don't have much time left. Okay. No. Perfect. All right. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Then I'll be back. I'm doing the Dirty Mitten. I think it's September 25th. And that's like a, a off-road duathlon. So I'll be running and biking. Where's that held? That's all down in Hastings, Yankee oh. area. I think it's some of the Barry Roubaix course, the bike portion. Okay, cool. Yeah. So it's is it is the run on gravel too? The run is on trail, like trail and like grassy double track. Oh. Yeah. And then the ride is basically gravel and maybe some paved road. It's mostly from what I did it last year. I think it's mostly all gravel. Okay. I don't remember much pavement at all. That sounds cool. Yeah. And that's called the Dirty Mitten. Yeah. What is your favorite local trail to ride and why? Okay. Well, that's an easy answer. Cannonsburg. <laughs> <laughs> Cannonsburg. But actually, it's always been my favorite trail um, just because I feel like it's slightly old school. A lot of new trails have a ton of flow, which is awesome. But I kind of just like the style of this where you have to work for it a little bit more. It's where I trained for a lot of my races, too, because there's more elevation here. And it's, just, I don't know, it's just really fun. And obviously, being able to ride out my office door is a giant bonus, too. So it's easy to pick. That's a big bonus. I'll have to agree with you. And I agree with you, too. I like the old school trails. So I do like, I mean, I like the flowy trails, like you said, but I do like Cannonsburg because there's a toughness to it. And I do like Awasapi because there's a toughness to it. And both of them are, you know, they're both old school, single track, just tough. And they will beat you up. Definitely. So if you want to get better at the bike, at the mountain bike, hit one of those trails or hit them both. Yeah. Yeah. And then another one I've always really liked is Yankee. Yep. So... When I had to go race at Worlds, I remember my longest training day. I just went and did eight laps of Yankee. I was just like shut off my brain, kept going. <laughs> Heck yeah. yeah. I don't get down there as much because it's like from the from the lake to Grand Rapids to south. So I, Cannonsburg works for me if I want something like that over there. So Yeah. But I, Yankee is fun, and that is another one that's just like those. I agree. What has been your most memorable race on the bike? It's a toss up between the world championships because that was in Scotland, but I'd have, I would say that's my most memorable um, just because it was such a beautiful course and everyone racing had, you know, they were from all different countries. So I do a lap with someone, yeah, everyone had different accents. It was really fun. And like, you know, they had like bagpipes starting us off and whiskey and our drop bags. <laughs> and it was just like, it was so beautiful out there. And you said that was in Scotland. Yep. It was in Fort William, Scotland. I think they do a really like big downhill World Cup there. Or they used to. I think they still do. Yes. Fort Williams, right? Is that what you yeah. said? Yeah. Yep. I think they do. It's like on the Ben Nevis range. It's really, really, really pretty out there. Okay. Any other reason why that was more, most memorable? Gosh, I think it was just, I had a really good race too. Like it was one of those races where I never really wanted to stop, which is unusual in a 24 hour race. And just being able to explore a little bit afterwards. Normally with racing, I would, you know, go to the race and then the next day drive home. But we were able to go to like 
check out a little bit of the country and then go to Amsterdam. So that was fun. Seeing new places. So that definitely adds more of that. You know, that was memorable. Yep. Especially being around other athletes too, like you said, with different accents. I like that idea. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it was fun. You meet a bunch of people during 24-hour racing and it's cool. Yeah. And you didn't have that six hour like, oh, it's only hour six. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) How about not a race? How about like a solo ride or a group ride or an adventure ride that was the most memorable? And explain that. One ride that's super memorable is riding up with Jill Martindale and Julie Whalen. I remember we left at like 3 a.m. and our goal was to ride our fat bikes up to the Iceman race. And we did. We did. But it was just, I remember like we left so early in the morning, you know, it was pitch black and stopping at gas station for like, you know, all the good gas station snacks. And I think Jill actually raced the next day in fat bike, but it was a long day on a bike, but super fun. (laughs) Was that 2017-ish? Probably. Yeah. I think I remember seeing that on on the social media post from someone that (laughs) there were these three crazy ladies that (laughs) rode their bikes up to the (laughs) Iceman to do the Iceman. Yeah, I didn't I didn't race the Iceman, but I think I know Jill did because I think she also won the fat bike category. So yeah. Next, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hmm. Some ideas. Totally, yes. This year. <laughs> Go get it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Who's been your biggest competition along the way when you were racing? And tell us about a time when you went head to head. I did a lot of the National Ultra Endurance Series, which was like 100 milers. It's still going on. Like, I think Lumberjack's a part of it. Mergy might be a part of it. But for a long time, I was racing against this woman from Tennessee. Her name's Carrie Lowry. And we were always kind of like going neck and neck. She's an amazing athlete, like one of the friendliest people I've ever met. But um, there was one year where we were racing Kahata 100, and which is down in Tennessee. It's like her home course. And I was in first place up until two miles till the finish. So, I mean, I thought in my mind, like, I have the win. This is mine. And I heard her voice right behind me. And it came down to a sprint finish after 100 miles. Oh. <laughs> I'm proud to say I took it. But, like, I said I won 100 miles, I think, by 10 seconds. But it's probably only because I had 40 pounds on her. <laughs> oh. <laughs> But definitely we would always go back to back. And I had an interval named after her. Like my coaches say, like, do 20 one minute intervals. And I'd always call, like, I'm going to do a carry interval. So I'd always add one extra interval on. Hey, that's good. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Mentally stronger. Remembering that. Per- yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Why do you love the sport and what keeps you going in it? I would say that mountain biking reminds me a lot of trail running, which is kind of what I've segued into. And it just offers this escape. It makes you feel like a kid again. I remember once reading, I think it was like a New York Times article about how a lot of adults lose their sense of wonderment. And I think that's so true. And I can see why, like, if you're just stuck in a routine, I guess I shouldn't say stuck, but a lot of people, you know, just have a routine day to day, you go to work, you come home, you're worried about bills and you have all these stresses. I think being able to get out into nature and riding a bike brings back that joy that you felt as a child. And you're able to just like be away from anything that might be stressing you out because it's impossible. I mean, it's really hard to be stressed while you're on a bike and you're having fun, like ride down a dirt hill and get a little bit muddy and like you can't not have fun. I'm going to have to agree with you. Nature and fun outdoors away from all of life's stresses. Oh, yeah. I think it's so <laughs> healing. I mean, it's it's amazing. And I see that with the dirt dogs, too. Like when they arrive sometimes, um, you know, we have other kids programs as well. A lot of times they'll be really nervous. But once they're out in the woods, they start to open up so much. And you can just almost see everyone like do this like audible, audible sigh where they're just like, oh, I feel better. So, yep. I see the same thing when when I'm with the coyotes. It's just, there's something about it. Gets people open and talking and feeling better. Yeah. Did you or do you incorporate strength training in your routine? Yes. So I did it a lot more, but I used to train with Jason Ross from Train Out Pain. 
I was really lucky. He lives in town. He um, was a strength coach for like the United States bobsled team. So he had me doing Bulgarian split squats, a lot of Turkish get-ups, you know, a lot of plyo exercises. So when I was racing um, pretty much full-time, I would work out with him at least twice a week, and it helped immensely. Nice. Yep. Especially for endurance racing, if you think about it, like you're bent at the waist and your core is supporting you. And with longer races, I mean, your triceps, your neck muscles, you know, your back muscles, everything has to be strong or you will get injured. And if you're not strong and you, you're riding your fat bike through some mashed potato snow and your front tire goes and you're going to go over the bars instead of staying on the bike. <laughs> this is this is very true. Yes. <laughs> But one other thing, too, is when I first started working out with him, I was starting to get IT band. Tightness. Like IT band, IT band like, and, and injured IT band. I can't remember what you call it, but it was inflamed. And it's just because my quad muscles were so overdeveloped, which, help, you know, it happens with cyclists a lot. So I think it's really important to balance out the muscles you probably don't use as much. I'm going to second that. Did you or do you have a piece of equipment that was your favorite strength-wise? I liked kettlebells a lot for kettlebell swings, um, that, and then I just was like those exercise balls. I would use those a lot for core strength. Like the medicine balls or the big? Yeah, the med- Oh, the big ones, the big. The, the big, big ones with air? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I would do like a lot of like planks on those and have to like move them around with my core and also like, yeah. Good. So you're balanced training and you're strengthening your core at the same time. Yep, definitely. Good. <laughs> Would you lift during a race week? I don't think so. I think I would usually take that week off okay. from what I remember. Yeah. Okay. That sounds about did, right. Yeah. Or if I did, it'd be something super light. Okay. Did you do anything specific for recovery after workouts or races? Towards the end of my career, I started doing yoga, hot yoga, and that actually helped a lot. But Other than that, I would try to incorporate a lot of protein into my diet because I was a slow, like, recoverer. My coach would always have me, you know, have a recovery drink. I think I used Carbo Rocket made one, and Infinite made a recovery drink that I like, too. And other than that, sleep is the most important. Sleep, you know, making sure you're drinking enough water, just all of the easy things to do that a lot of people, I have a hard time doing. Yeah, drinking a lot of water after hard workouts and races is great. And getting yeah. good sleep is great. Yep. Right? <laughs> That's when the body recovers. What is or was your favorite interval workout to do on the bike? Did you like shorter, high intensity intervals? Did you like the longer ones? One of my favorites, I can't remember the name, but it was where I would do intervals for 10 minutes straight. And it would be 30 seconds all out and then 30 seconds recovery. So you do that nonstop for 10 minutes. And I think I do like four sets of those. Nice. And that um, I would usually do a lot of those in the winter. And basically it trains your body to be able to recover after really hard effort. So when you're going, you know, like in a race like Barry Roubaix or Iceman, you have to be like at your top end and then be able to go again constantly. Like you're not racing at your top end, you're trying to stay at other people's top ends. And those types of workouts helped me a ton. Yeah, you got to be ready for someone else's move, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I and personally, I like 30 second and minute intervals. That, that those are always my favorite. I just for some reason, I dread the longer threshold, steady state, you know, those, I don't, <laughs> I just, yeah, it's harder to stay in the pain cave for me for a long time like that when there's nothing there, you know, there's no race, there's no, con- it's just you. So it's, again, oh yeah, I remember having to do 20 minute power tests where you have to like basically go all out for 20 minutes and like mentally I would want to stop, like I would have conversations with myself, like get off your bike and tell your coach you like had a flat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. I would be hurting myself and I'm like considering lying to a coach, but they were so terrible. Right. Yeah. I got a flat today. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm positive that, that it probably wouldn't be the first time that a coach had heard that. But... Right. right. Oh, that's funny. Is there one race that you could do over? If you think back, and what would you have done differently? Yes, yes. yeah. There was a race um, in Boston, and I can't remember the name, but it was a 24-hour race. And it was when I had just started 24-hour racing. 
And I was in second place, but catching first. And I was afraid to like really let myself go and try to get her. Like my brain kept saying like, no, stay where you are. And I wish I would have just gone for it. And I think that I was afraid of letting myself down. But in reality, I ended up letting myself down anyways because I didn't try. So I would like to go back there and go get her. <laughs> I've had some of those. Mm-hmm. And you after the race, it's the same thing. You just, I, I think it over and over, like, why didn't you just go for them? Why didn't yeah, you just totally. Go I mean, what do you have to lose? I mean, you really don't have anything to lose. You would know one way or the other, right? Right, because you're losing right now. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> Just go do it. Yeah. If you blow up, who cares? Yeah. I'll remember that during the marathon. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> Just go for it. If you could spend one week training with another athlete, who would it be and why? I guess I'd probably like, I feel like I'm just being selfish at this point, and I'd want to train with April Morgan or Namrita or Dave. Both are phenomenal athletes, but I'm also really good friends with them because it'd be so fun. <laughs> so I, I right now at this point, I just want to like train with my friends, but they're also really good athletes. Right. Well, that's perfect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Perfect answer. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do pre-competition to get yourself ready and motivated? Do you do any music, mental visualization, rituals, routines? It's all new now because I've been, I'm starting to do more running races, but in the past I did have like a strict routine. It was mostly the day before I knew that I couldn't have caffeine after 10 a.m. because it would affect my sleep a lot. And I would try to get like all of my gear bags and gear just ready by like late afternoon just to like have everything that I could control like taken care of. Because for me, when I go to bed, laying in bed and like thinking of everything that had to be done would just stress me out. So it was just getting everything dialed in, taken care of. And then the rest of the night, just go, trying to watch like stupid TV or reading, just get my mind off of the race. Like I used to make the mistake of visualizing race courses and then my heart rate would be like 120 and I'd be in bed like shaking, you know what I mean? <laughs> Super nervous. Like, and then in the morning, just making sure that I, you know, drink coffee, ate food, got ready to go. I think uh, I'm the same the day before. Mm-hmm. Uh, minus all caffeine. I can't do any caffeine. My body does not react well with it. But having everything ready, everything's packed. I can't, I just have to have it done so I can relax. And, yeah. then, the, and then the same thing, mindless TV or something. Yeah. And I think that's, I th- I've heard that from quite a few people that race too. Do you ever feel like, well, I guess you're going to do it anyway. So that question's I didn't know you were going to race again this year, so I was going to ask a different question. But you're going to do the the duathlon and you're you're running, so that question's irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, if you're asking about like mountain bike racing, so one race I think I might go back to, but it's only if my strength coach goes and races it is the Lumberjack 100 because we're going to bet each other on who can win, and I would do it on a single speed. Oh I've done that race 12 times, so I was like, nah, I'm done with it, but I will go back one more. A head to head. Head to head, though. <laughs> so we'll you already see. have your big saw? Yes. Yep. Awesome. I'll bring my saw with me and ride with it. <laughs> Just to intimidate him. <laughs> Up in the challenge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to single speed with my saw. <laughs> All right. What trail would you recommend anywhere in the world that is a must ride? I was out um, in British Columbia out at Whistler. And I would say if you could go out there and ride those trails, they are amazing. And I wish I could, that's another place I'd love to go back. I did um, 24 hour worlds out there and I'd love to, I would love to just go and ride and hang out because it's beautiful out there. That's on my bucket list. Yeah. (laughs) It's, I mean, it's such good riding and like, just like the whole atmosphere out there is so much fun. Yeah. It, it just looks like the stoke is high. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you were to give any advice to younger athletes that look up to you, what would it be? Well, I think this is super cliche to say, but enjoy the ride. Because when I first started racing, I was always so, I always just wanted to get faster and faster. So I never really enjoyed the process of getting faster. Um, I think the little moments are kind of what matter more than like the actual race. 
So like enjoy the ride, enjoy being super young, enjoy making a bunch of mistakes along the way because like looking back, I remember that way more than any race now. Great advice. Mm -hmm. And she's a veteran, so she knows what she's talking about. Yes, totally. (laughs) (laughs) Is there anything else you'd like to say before we sign off? I was thinking I sound so like old talking about 26 inch wheels. I better sound current. Snapchat, um, my YouTube (laughs) channel. (laughs) No, I'm on, I'm on Instagram. Write me a letter. (laughs) (laughs) Write her a letter and send it to Cannonsburg. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So find her on Instagram. (laughs) (laughs) Not Snapchat. Not Snapchat, no. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> Danielle, this has been a great conversation. We've had a lot of laughing. I'm yeah, very, <laughs> I'm very glad we were able to connect, and I look Same. forward to seeing what some of those dirt dogs can do when they get older as they continue to ride. Awesome! Thank you. <laughs> yes. You have just listened to Unpacking the Athlete.